Dishman, Carbogen, Amsis Limited, Q3FY22 earnings conference call. As a reminder, all participant lines will be in the listen-only mode, and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during the conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star then zero on your touchstone phone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Mark Griffiths, Global CEO. Thank you and over to you, Mr. Griffiths. Thank you very much, moderator. Um, I hope wherever you all are in the world that you're having a good and safe day. And uh, I want to run through a couple of uh, points. Um, first of all, I want to uh, give apologies for Mr. Arpadias. Unfortunately, he's been unavoidably detained. Um, so I won't be joining us today, but I'll take you through the summary and then I'll hand over to our CFO, Mr. Hashir Galau, and then we'll hand over to our independent director, Mr. Sanjay Mujmada, for any uh, final comments. Um, as you can see from the presentation, we've had a pretty strong quarter, especially in Crans. Um, we continue to make really good progress on the UDQM issues in India, and we're about 80% free those items now, which is remarkable, uh, remarkable progress, and we're very uh, confident that we'll be able to meet the end time point for that and uh, get ourselves back and qualified in India. The market generally remains very, very strong, especially for crowns. As you can see from the pipeline, uh, the pipeline continues to be very strong. Um, as it relates to uh, marketable molecules, we still see uh, very, very good interest and strong growth in the vitamin D analogs. Our cholesterol business is stable, which is also very good. Um, and our disinfectant and quarterly compound business remains, uh, remains interesting to customers. And we're making progress there as well. COVID, however, does remain a challenge to manage. We are managing it along with every other company in the world, but it is a challenge. Um, generally, one of the biggest issues we've seen is a, is a rapid rise in transportation and logistic costs. And we're obviously managing that with our clients uh, as we move forward. And of course, the general worry is that uh, there, are, there are crazy rising prices, especially in Central Europe, for uh, basic utilities like gas, electricity, water, etc. And again, these are challenges that we have to, uh, to manage, at least in the short term. But in a general sense, the business is moving forward. The trajectory is as we have planned and as we've all talked about over the last couple of years. So what I'd like to do now is uh, to hand over to Mr. Hashir Galal, our CFO, and we'll take you through some of the headline numbers. Uh, thank you very much. I'm looking forward to an energetic and interesting discussion. Over to you, Hashir Bay. Thank you very much, Mark. Hello, everybody. Uh, I hope uh, you, your families, are, are safe during this COVID time. Um, as far as the quarter is concerned, uh, it was a very strong quarter for us at a consolidated level. We clocked a revenue of 562 crores uh, for the quarter ended December 31, 2021. And uh, this translates into a nine months performance of uh, 1,571 crores um, as against 1,382 crores uh, for the nine months last year. Our gross margins uh, remain strong as well. So we, we had a gross margin of around 77% for the quarter uh, and about 81% for the nine months. So as we have been saying, our gross margins uh, are typically in the range of about 80, 82%. So we are very much on target for that. The employee expenses uh, during the quarter does show an increase as compared to comparable quarter last year. Uh, but one of the major reasons is basically we, we require people, we require the scientists in order to, in order to make sure that we are able to fulfill the, 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 the pipeline, the strong pipeline that we have on the development side. As you can see from the presentation, uh, typically our, our development pipeline is around 90, 95 million. As it is that uh, right now we have a development pipeline of about 115 million. So these additional employee expenses would translate into incremental revenue uh, in, the, in, in the near to long-term future. The other expenses uh, stood at about 60, 68, 69 crores. 
uh, as compared to 82 crores in the in in the previous quarter and 96 crores in the comparable quarter last year. So we had a certain reversal of provisions in the current quarter, uh, which was uh, and these provisions were done in the in the first six months, which were no longer required, and hence uh, and, and hence you see a lower of their expenses. All of this translated into an EBITDA of about 109.5 crores for the quarter and uh, 309 crores uh, for the first nine months. Uh, so our EBITDA margin for the quarter stood at about 19% and about 20% for the nine months as compared to about 13% in the, in the comparable quarter last year and uh, similar kind of number for the nine months uh, FY21. Um, as far as our finance cost is concerned, that more or less uh, remains in line with uh, what we had last year, um, which is close to about 40 crores for the first nine months. And uh, we, did, we reported a profit before tax of about 38 crores for the quarter, uh, which translates into about 81 crores for uh, the nine months as compared to a loss of 51 crores uh, for the first nine months of last year. The tax rate uh, of 8% uh, that you can see for the quarter, uh, that's largely because of uh, certain uh, certain tax provisions that were done in the first six months because of, uh, of the new uh, tax regime that our Swiss subsidiary now has, uh, largely because of the, of the corporate tax reforms that have been now implemented, which effectively reduces the tax rates in Switzerland. So on a conservative basis, we had made some provisions which are also reversed in the current quarter as those are no longer required. So this translates into a reported path of 35 crores uh, for the quarter, which translates into about 62 crores for the nine months ended December 31, 2021. As far as our uh, segment-wise breakup is concerned, uh, we keep on seeing uh, a good amount of improvement as far as the Grand India business is concerned, uh, we reported a revenue of about 40 crores for the third quarter and uh, 111 crores for the nine months in the current financial year as compared to 40 crores uh, last year for the first nine months. So as, as Mark mentioned, we are seeing an uh, uptick in the revenues, uptick in the, in the customer orders. Uh, we have a very strong order book for the Grand India business which now uh, we are trying to fulfill. We have received clearances from most of our customers to, to restart the production. And uh, most of the plants in the Babla facility are now up and running. And that should translate into a higher amount of revenue in the coming quarters as well. As far as uh, the Swiss, France, and China business is concerned, that reported one of the strongest quarters uh, that we have seen. So close to about 393 crores of revenue in the quarter, uh, which is a growth of about 31% as compared to Q3 of last year. And uh, for the first nine months, that translates into 996 crores of revenue. Grants UK reported a revenue of about 28 crores and, uh, for, the, uh, for the quarter, and that's about 94 crores for the nine months uh, ended December 31, 2021. So as far as the cramps uh, segment is concerned, we reported a revenue of 461 crores, which is a growth of uh, 34% as compared to Q3 of last year. And uh, on a nine month basis, uh, we report a revenue of 1200 crores as compared to 1045 crores uh, reported in the nine months of FY21. So this represents a 15% growth in the cramps uh, revenue. As far as the marketable molecule segment is concerned, the major contributor is uh, Carbogenamsis BB, our Dutch subsidiary. Uh, it reported a revenue of 54 crores for the quarter and uh, 242 crores for the nine months, uh, as compared to 64 crores for the quarter and 189 crores for the nine months of FY21. Uh, we we uh, did not see those many shipments of uh, vitamin D analogs in, in the last quarter, and that is the reason you see a dip in revenue as compared to last year Q3. But as we have been mentioning, um, you know, it's, it's difficult to compare us on a quarterly basis. 
So uh, in the current quarter, we are expecting a good amount of shipment of vitamin D analog out of the Dutch subsidiary. And uh, that would mean a significantly strong year for Cambridge and MCS BB. As far as the other segment is concerned, which uh, largely includes our traditional products from India, uh, that reported a 46 crores of revenue for the quarter and 127 crores for the nine months. All of this put together resulted into marketable molecule segment reporting a revenue of 100 crores for the quarter and uh, 370 crores for the first nine months. So that was as far as the revenues were concerned. And uh, as far as the margins are concerned, uh, I mean, you can see that uh, Cramps India is now reporting a positive EBITDA uh, with the revenues that we are generating right now uh, from the products that we delivered in December quarter as well as for the first nine months. And uh, this can just keep on getting better as we move into the future. Uh, France, Switzerland, France, China reported uh, close to 20, 21% margin, and uh, that's pretty much on track. Crams UK um, on a nine-month nine basis reported 18.6% margin. Uh, Carbage and Amsis BV, 30% margin uh, as compared to 34.5% in the nine months of last year, and that is largely on account of uh, lower supplies of vitamin D analogs, which should happen in the current quarter. So that was as far as the margins uh, on a segment-wise uh, basis is concerned. As far as the net debt is concerned, uh, that has increased in the current quarter, uh, and that is mainly on account of the expansion that we are undertaking right now between Switzerland and France. Uh, so some of, since some of the CapEx is front-ended, uh, we had to take certain debt, which is obviously available at very cheap cost. So our net debt, excluding these liabilities, stands at 122 million as on December 30, 2021. And the capital expenditure that was incurred in the last quarter was about 20 million. Hello. Hello. Hello, sir. Can you stay connected? The line has got disconnected. Yeah. Yep. I'm still here. Yeah, yeah, I'm also there. <clears throat> so we're back in the call. You may please yeah. proceed. Yeah, thank you. Is it, is it all all for uh, more, every, everybody connected on the phone? The line has been connected. You can continue. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So the capital expenditure for the first nine months is uh, close to about fifty million, and um, uh, and, and uh, we expect uh, another ten million of ten to fifteen million of additional capex uh, to happen in the last quarter. Uh, but the expansion program uh, that we had set, uh, that's very much on track, and uh, we expect uh, the commercial operations in France to begin in January of 2023. I think with that, uh, I'd like to hand over the call to our independent director, Mr. Sanjay Majmudar, for his comments. Thank you very much. Thank you, Harshil. Thank you, Mark. Good afternoon to everyone. So I think um, the highlight of the quarter, as explained by Mark and Harshil, is that things are on track. Everything is looking good. Globally, the businesses are looking very, very robust, be it Carbogen MCs, that is the main Switzerland operations, Holland operations, France operations. Even China is picking up. And from an Indian perspective, I think we are coming closer to the last mile phase of the uh, corrective action plan for the EDQM, hopefully by first quarter of next year. If the, the acceptance is there, then I think next year we should see more or less Dishman India, including Bavla, coming back to the original normal self because most of the customers have already, you know, approved the facilities and 
uh, I think overall everything looks to be uh, on track uh, and uh, hopefully next year should be the complete normalcy plus the normal growth and obviously a significant growth in the margins thanks to India stopping uh, even minor marginal losses and coming back to the positive uh, trajectory. I think uh, with this moderator, let's uh, throw the house open for Q&A. Thank you. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on the touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. The first question is from line of Nishit Shah with Ambika Fin Capital. Please go ahead. Thank you for taking my questions and congratulations on a good set of numbers. Uh, my first question is uh, to Mark on the uh, products business. Uh, we had uh, three segments on the vitamin D derivatives, the antibiotics and on the antidepressants. So can you elaborate what is the progress and what is the status now on each of these areas please? Yeah, um, I, I think we, let's take the vitamin D analogs first. Um, that is a market that is relatively stable at the moment. Um, what we see is uh, incremental growth on low volume, high value products. What we're doing, uh, as we've mentioned over the last 18 months, is we're investing more of our, our receivables into research and development to expand the penetration of those products. So you'll know that we've been, uh, we've been partnering with Boston University on a number of research projects looking at uh, the impacts of one of the vitamin D analogs on uh, COVID and on obesity, uh, patients who have gastric bypass. Um, we're expanding those trials and we've just signed up in the last, just before Christmas, to also study the effect of calcifidiol on multiple sclerosis patients. There is a lot of um, evidence that uh, says that there are significant benefits to um, a much heavily boosted immune system for MS sufferers. And we're performing a series of clinical trials uh, with a, an independent organization enabling us to uh, study that. So the idea behind it is that we continue to maintain the business and drive it forward from a, an, an incremental perspective. But these products have opportunities way beyond the ones we're currently uh, exploiting. So that's the area of growth for us. Um, and those projects are moving forward. Of course, you know, clinical trials take time. The patents have been filed. We're still waiting for a response back from the patent office. But at the moment, everything looks good. So we'll be able to lock in some IP on some of these indications as well, which is rather exciting. As it relates to the other products, they're not really what I would call franchises in themselves. The, maybe what we've, we've had is a bit of confusion. One of the areas we're looking at is disinfectants. It's a traditional business. Uh, in fact, where Mr. V.S. Senior actually started Dishman way back 40 years ago. Similar to what we've been doing with the analogs, we're looking at the efficacy of some of the uh, disinfectants that we have. And we've embarked on a research project based on some R&D work that our colleagues in India have uh, done on encapsulating certain uh, disinfectants. And we're looking at uh, studying ways of being able to encapsulate disinfectant for bacteria with a microbial, um, with a viral uh, agent. That means that we're heading towards a super disinfectant that can deal both with uh, viruses and with bacteria. Um, and that's something that we have embarked upon with the University of Lausanne as a partner in uh, working on, on this. So what we're doing with those businesses is we're bringing them back to their normalcy. 
And then we're looking at what other benefits, what other areas of opportunity exist for these businesses. And then we're going out and pursuing those. So we see quite a bit of potential growth in those businesses where maybe in the past the view was that they were stable businesses and they were just good baseload. Um, we actually believe that there's opportunity there to significantly increase the headroom for the business. And being a product business, of course, uh, the margins can be uh, quite interesting. So um, we're on the trajectory we've set internally for these projects, but it's all about um, looking at those products and, and doing work ourselves to bring new indications and new areas of interest for these products so that we can increase the uh, attractiveness of the business there. Uh, uh, thanks, uh, Mark. Uh, uh, on on the uh, products that are in the pipeline and in validation, how many yeah. of the products have uh, been approved or uh, in a quarter or in uh, last 12 months and which are going commercial? And uh, last time, I, if I recollect correctly, I think there are 10 in the validation stage. Now, of that, what is the progress? If you can give some color on that. Um, <clears throat> I'll do my best because it's not in our control in terms of, you know, the end point and where the customers file. But I think I've been fairly consistent in saying a good performance for us over, you know, blended over many years would be somewhere between two and three commercializations a year. That would be good performance. Well, we're, we're at four this year already. Um, we had another one approved by the Japanese authorities on the 20th of January. Um, it's a product we've been working on for a very long time, but it's just been approved in, in Japan. Um, and it's now a commercial product. So um, I think it's fair to say that my estimation of, of you know, somewhere between two and three a year blended over the last five or six years, it seems to be that the acceleration is, is, is there. I would anticipate no more before the end of this year. But that puts us at four which is a good 20% above what we've estimated. And I think I'd be bullish enough, knowing about the pipeline at the moment, that, that we'd certainly be in line for another three next year. Um, and I may be proved wrong, and it may be more. Uh, I hope I am proved wrong. But unfortunately, I'm not in control of it. We as an organization are not in control. But the pipeline is strong enough. I mean, if you look at what's in validation, you know, we've got 10 or 11 in validation, some drop off. One drops off last month. Um, and the customers pulled the plug on the product. It's a small customer, it's a small indication. And that can still happen, but we've got enough in the pipeline that, you know, somewhere between 10 and 11 in the pipeline is remarkable in validation. It's a huge amount of work and it's a remarkable performance. And I would anticipate that being a standard. As products go, uh, go uh, commercial, then there's other products in the pipeline. And, you know, we've got 18 plus in late phase three and validation. So the pipelines are remarkably strong. Stronger than I've ever uh, seen it, frankly speaking. Yeah, my last question is, uh, Mark, on the yep. uh, expansion in Switzerland on the EDC side and the injectable yep. expansion in France. Uh, are yes. you on track? And if you can elaborate yes. on that. I'd be delighted to. So France is the biggest investment at the moment that we're currently right in the middle of. Um, the, the building is complete, the shell and the main infrastructure has been installed. We're now going into the, the most challenging part of the project, which is the installation of all of the uh, specialized equipment. We are on track, as Hashubai said, we are on track for starting production at the end of January in 2023. That was always our target and remarkably we're still on track even with COVID and some of the other challenges with microchips and things like that, we are still on track to complete and be ready to, uh, to start. And in fact, there's a huge amount of marketing effort now going into marketing that facility. Uh, so we're talking to a lot of customers. We've got three dedicated salespeople now in the market um, pushing this, this uh, new this new venture of ours, and we're seeing a lot of interest in the market. So I'm entirely comfortable with our trajectory on that project. Um, 
And I think at the next, what we'll do is I'll ask Kashil at the next presentation to put some photographs in the uh, in the investor presentation so you can see what we're up to there. I think that would be nice for you guys to see. The other investments are moving forward. So the ADC one, the joint investment with um, a very important client of ours, is on target. We uh, The building is complete in Switzerland and the equipment is now being installed. We are hoping that that will be online around about September, October of this year, ready to start ramping up the production of that, uh, that material for that customer. So uh, at the moment, things are on track. You know, it's difficult with COVID, I have to say. That's the one variable I can't control. Um, and we have seen some challenges. We've mostly been able to mitigate those. Um, but I can't control microchip supply out of out of South Korea <laughs> and China. Um, but but so far we're on track. Yeah, thanks. And uh, all the best. I will come back in the queue. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for your questions. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from Witwick from One Up Financial Consultants Private Limited. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, good evening. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, firstly, on the employee cost. Uh, so, you know, uh, our employee cost has uh, risen uh, from sub 200 crores in uh, seven, eight quarters to about 255, 255 crores in this quarter. So, where does this uh, stabilize uh, before we start seeing uh, some uh, uh, revenue on the investment that we are doing on the employees uh, employee side in the last eight quarters. Sure, thanks, Richard, for your question. So, uh, you know, if you compare with the employment cost in this quarter versus uh, what we had about eight quarters back, uh, there are two factors which have resulted in the increase. One is obviously uh, additional employees that we have to recruit for the new projects as well as for the projects under validation. And as Mark mentioned, we have about 10 to 11 under validation and close to about 18 in late phase three. So that is one of the driving factors. Second is also uh, the forex impact. Uh, so as, as you can see, uh, most of our employee cost is, is coming out of the Swiss entity and uh, all the reported numbers are in Indian rupees. Mm -hmm. So from about eight quarters back to now, the Swiss franc would have depreciated by almost uh, 12 to 15%. So that is also having a negative impact on the reported numbers in, in Indian rupees uh, in the in the PNL that we report here. Uh, as far as translation into revenue is concerned, uh, we expect that um, you know, minimum of uh, three molecules to go commercial each financial year, and that should incrementally keep on adding revenue over the next two to three years' time. Also, one of the important things to understand is that we don't start generating revenue immediately after we, we recruit these people, these scientists, because there is at least uh, six to eight months of, uh, of training efforts that we need to put in in order to make sure that the scientists are able to work uh, according to the optimal efficiency that we would that we would expect out of them. So I would say um, from the next year um, onwards, we should see incremental revenues coming from uh, on, on the development side as well as on the new molecules which have gone commercial over the last uh, 12 to 24 months. Mark, do you want to add something to it? No, I think you've explained it pretty well. I think there, there are two factors. One is that labor costs in the West is increasing. Labor cost in China is increasing as well, by the way, um, which represents a fantastic opportunity for India if we can keep labor costs under control uh, in India, but that's a separate discussion. I think you know, labor costs in France, we are rapidly reaching the conclusion of the investment there. Now, our French operation up until a year ago was 20, 23 people. The French operation with this uh, increase in capacity with this new, new investment is going to take our French staff to about 65 people. And those people need to be hired, and they need to be hired ahead of the facility being uh, ready to go. Not all of them, but some of them. So engineers, the plant managers being hired, 
we've restructured the business there now to uh, to, to, to recognise the fact it's no longer a small development unit, but it's going to be a commercial manufacturing unit. So we're hiring people there that aren't generating revenue at the moment, but are making sure that the facility will be ready to generate revenue. Right. On the other side, as Hashir said, that uh, as the pipeline grows, we need more hands on deck to process the commitments that we've taken in purchase orders. And that $115 million represents, to be very clear, represents purchase orders received but not yet started. Now, if you compare that to three years ago when we were sitting there saying happily our order book would be about 80 million, you can see there's been a significant ramp up in our um, ability to capture work and good value work. Um, and we're always very careful with staff, so we always run the staff right on the edge. Um, and every so often we have to add more staff, and then what we have to do after a while is add more capacity, physical. And then we have to add more staff. So we tend to do it in incremental pieces rather than doing it all up front and carrying that cost. Right. Uh, it's just the way we operate. So I hope that, with, with Hashir's answer, gives you a picture. Yeah, yeah. So would, would it be uh, fair to assume that employee cost should stabilize around current levels or, uh, you know, uh, assuming the uh, Swiss franc uh, stays uh, around... Uh, uh, these levels uh, and employee cost to stabilize around 250 260 I would say so. Yeah, I think uh, we should stabilize at more or less around 250 260 Okay, sure. I mean, till the time you know we again keep on getting new and new orders and uh, the order book grows from where we are right now, and so do the monitoring. Kind of a lead indicator to the uh, potential revenues that will come in. The Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Sure. sure. Uh, and uh, so second uh, question is on, uh, you know, the uh, sh uh, increase in uh, revenues from the Crans, uh, Switzerland, France and China segment. So uh, would there be anything uh, specific, order specific, one order specific that would have driven this or this is uh, across all the three geographies and uh, this kind of uh, number uh, can be sustained going forward? Yeah, I think China, China's been something that we've been pushing very hard. Mm. Um, and, and as Hashil said, it is now positive and contributing rather than uh, being a drag on our, on our cogs. Um, we have three particular projects there where we have customers who are now committed to manufacture larger scale products and intermediates in China. And that will this year really show a nice uptick for China. And that's effort around convincing customers that you know, Switzerland is not the best place to do some of the larger larger volume work. Yeah. Um, and our China operation is 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 more than fit for purpose. Um, France is just, as we've increased our capability, we've increased our penetration in the market and attractiveness. Switzerland is a long-established business, as you will know. It's 35 years old, 40 years old. Um, what we're seeing is that we have become more effective in the market in selling. I think we've become a bit more efficient, so we're more competitive, and we still have some way to go on that, of course, and that's one of the initiatives for next year. Um, but also, the market is just very, very strong at the moment. Healthcare generally is is in the public eye, um, due to COVID in no small way, and I think that's, that's stimulated the money markets, especially in the areas uh, in the U.S., Small biotechs have been stimulated with a lot of investment going into small biotechs, southern Germany and the US. Um, and we're seeing the outcome of that, which is more projects, more customers active. The number of pharmaceutical companies is growing. Um, and as a result of that, there's a need for good contract manufacturers. And Dishman Carbogen Ansys is pretty good, frankly speaking. Sure, sure. Okay. And uh, my last question is on uh, uh, Babla. Uh, so last two quarters, we are stable at around uh, 40 crores uh, on a quarterly basis. Uh, so so uh, do you expect uh, quarterly improvement uh, from Q4 onwards or uh, as you mentioned in the opening remark that Q1 uh, uh, will stabilize and then uh, will ramp up. So 
uh, you know what is the direction uh, towards uh, pre uh, edqm issue uh, run rate and uh, last couple of quarters we've been saying that uh, we should uh, see quarter on quarter growth but uh, this quarter it's been flattish so anything specific to look into if you can just uh, throw some color on that yeah, so this week we do expect that uh, starting from Q4, we should see a uh, quarterly increase in the revenue on the Grand India segment. Uh, we had, uh, I mean, we were expecting one of the shipments for one specific order uh, to go out in December. However, uh, that, that's going out in February. So there was a delay in servicing that particular order on account of uh, certain engineering modifications that that we were undertaking in Babla. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the, we already have uh, orders in hand worth, worth about $30 million. Uh, and, uh, you know, we should see good amount of growth starting from Q4. Sure. Sure. Okay. And and uh, all the customers uh, which were uh, with us uh, before the issue have uh, approved uh, of the site, right? Uh, is, would that yes. Be yeah. So we do have orders from uh, almost all of those customers, except for uh, one of them, uh, where you know it, it's more of a discussion on the commercial side. Uh, but apart from that, yeah, most of the customers, uh, you know, either they have done a remote audit or they have been satisfied based upon the detailed risk analysis uh, which was supplied. So from that perspective, uh, we do have the orders from them. Having said that, we are still in the process of implementing the corrective action plan uh, that we had given to the EQM. And as Mark mentioned in the opening remarks, we are about 80-85% there. So uh, the plan is that in the next, um, I would say, six months time or so, uh, we we expect the EDQM to maybe do a re-inspection or um, I mean physical or remotely, and then we should get a clearance from them. So that's our internal expectation. Okay, okay, uh, okay, sure. Uh, that's it from my side. Uh, all the best and thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from Neelam Punjabi with Perpetuity Ventures. Please go ahead. Um, thanks for taking my question. Uh, my question pertains to a digrogesterone molecule. So the market for this formulation in India is growing at a very healthy pace of 40%. And the branded generic players who are entering this formulation mentioned in their earnings call that there are two, there are only two API manufacturers in India. And when I looked it up, I saw that Dishman is one of them. So I just wanted to know two things here. A, are we manufacturing the API end to end? or are we um, uh, manufacturing only the intermediate? And B, uh, given it is complex to manufacture this API, are we seeing any major opportunity there as the formulation market is growing at a very healthy pace? I think um, we are registered as a manufacturer of digestive digestion. Um we are looking at it um, internally, um, but we're not looking at it for the Indian market. We're looking at it for the uh, European and US market. So, so right now, we are we are, uh, we were manufacturing the the intermediate and not the final API for one of the customers. Uh, so you know, we are we are evaluating whether we we keep on manufacturing that N minus one or whatever it is, or uh, we manufacture the final API. So that is something under consideration right now. Got it. That's it from my end. Thank you and all the best. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of. Naman Jain, an investor. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, first of all, many congratulations on a uh, good set of numbers. Uh, good to see the company back in green. Uh, just a couple of things on my end. Uh, first is uh, taking the Bavla discussion forward. Uh, so the last time uh, we had a call, uh, uh, you mentioned that, uh, you know, uh, out of 13 units, 8 are up and running. Just wanted to get an update. Uh, what is the status now? Are so because we were expecting Q3 everything to be up and running. 
So, uh, so Naman, on, uh, so first of all, thank you for your compliment. Uh, coming to your uh, specific question, um, so out of the 13 units, yeah, about eight units are, are running right now. Uh, what we are evaluating is that uh, two or three of the units uh, which were manufacturing the non-GMP products, because and those were the units for which we actually received the operation. Uh, you know, we might not restart them in the near future. We might revamp them and convert them into uh, GMP units. And uh, what we have done over the last one and a half, uh, two years, is evaluated the products that we were manufacturing out of Pavla, which were non-GMP. And uh, basis uh, the, 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 the cost-benefit analysis, we might not even continue some of those products. So right now we believe that uh, the units which are which we have started in Babla, uh, those units should be sufficient uh, to supply the molecules and to supply the orders that we have on hand. We are trying to do a lot of uh, process efficiencies. We are trying to shift uh, some of the key starting materials manufacturing to our other facilities, which is in Naroda. Um, you know, a lot of things are going on, phases which within the existing age units which, which are running right now, we are trying to improve the efficiency and uh, cater to the customer's requirements. So uh, that is the status right now. And, um, you know, this, this age unit should be able to ramp up the production and, uh, and, and meet the customer's requirements. Okay. Uh, and I'm sorry I missed the opening uh, remarks uh, in the call. Uh, excuse me for that. But just wanted to check uh, on the UK and India crimes business, uh, there's a huge drop in EBITDA margin. So, uh, you know, we were good at France and Switzerland. But but could you just highlight on that as well? So, you know, if you see our UK business, that's more like... Um, you know, that's supplying the, uh, the the key starting materials, the intermediate and some specific products to our customers, as well as to the Swiss entity. So I think the right way to look at that particular business will be more so on a yearly basis in terms of the margin. Uh, so if you see the nine months, our EBITDA margin is uh, close to about 18%, and that's more or less in line with what we had last year. So we don't, um, I mean, it, it just depends like which products were actually supplied in this quarter versus the previous quarter or what's supposed to be supplied in the next quarter. But more or less on a yearly basis, uh, we believe that the margin should be similar to what we had last year. As far as India is concerned, uh, as compared to last year, you know, where we were incurring losses because of lower revenue, because of fixed costs hitting us, uh, because of the EQM issues that we had. So as you can see, the margins are now in the positive range in the last two quarters, and uh, and that's largely on account of the increase in the grants revenue that we have reported in the last two quarters. So going forward, as the revenue of grants coming from India keeps on increasing, we will see these margins increasing as well. I think just to add to what Harshu has said, You've also got to think about these businesses. They are interconnected. So a quantity of what comes out of Bavlo uh, in India goes directly to Switzerland for further processing. 80% of the output of Manchester is actually to support early stages in product uh, manufacture for Switzerland. So they kind of are integrated um, in some way, shape, or form. They're connected. They're not standalone. Okay, okay. Thank, thanks for that, Mark. Uh, great thanks. information. Yeah, and just uh, on a console level, uh, in maybe a couple of years from now, what EBITDA margins do are we looking at? Because I think we are at about 20% right now. We've reached 20%. Uh, top line is similar to, I think, we'll clock pre-COVID levels maybe this year as well. Uh, but on a margin basis, console level, what blended margins can we look at? So we expect that uh, you know, if you take a three to five year view, we should be closer to 30% at an EBITDA level. Okay, okay. And just one final point from my end. There was this uh, uh, promoter company loan that was outstanding, which was, uh, you know, uh, uh, promoter that uh, sold off their shares and repaid some part of it. Uh, any yeah. updated status on that? Is that closed or is there some outstanding or 
and when it is to be cleared yeah so uh, we had already uh, i mean there was already a repayment done of about 72 odd crores uh, so now the outstanding uh, i mean i'll have to get the exact figure but i think it's uh, close to about 50 to 60 crores um so that should happen um, i would say in the next uh, 12 months or so okay okay all right Thank but you. we don't we don't plan to do any work as for that yeah yeah you clarified this in the last call as well yeah exactly yeah thank you so much and all the best for your future quarters thanks thank you very much naman thank you thank you ladies and gentlemen again if you have a question please press star then one on your telephone keypad <laughs> The next question is from Vitwik with One Up Financial Consultants Private Limited. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, thanks for the follow up. Uh just uh you know taking a 3 to 5 year view uh with uh, France and Switzerland uh we're looking to expand capacity in the next uh 12 months. So you know with the base uh of uh, Bavla ramping up uh and uh existing facilities and uh, in and uh, the ex, uh, expansion uh, at France and Switzerland so what could be the potential uh, peak utilization uh, for the company like in terms of uh, turnover if we can uh, throw some light so let's take uh, you know really taking a 3 to 5 year view uh, we can expect a compounded annual growth rate of about 15% anywhere between 15 to uh, 18% Okay. Okay. From uh, yeah. FY22, uh, base of about uh, 2,000 odd crores revenue. That's correct. That's, That's correct. correct. That's right. Okay. 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 Fine. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Again, if you have a question, please press star then one on your telephone keypad. I think if there are no more questions, we can close the call, Harshil. Yeah, that should be okay. Thank you. As there are no further questions, I would now like to hand the conference over to the management for closing comments. Okay. So, uh, first of all, from my perspective, thank you very much. Um, this team is working hard to continue to meet our commitments, both to our customers and to our investors and promoters. um we'll continue to work very hard to uh, generate the uh, the promises that we're making and the commitments that we've uh, taken on so thanks for your support thank you for your questions and we look forward to speaking to you at uh, the year end call over to you hashim thank you very much everybody thanks for joining in the call and uh, you know we look forward to your continued support and uh, we also look forward to talking to you sometime in april or may thank you very much thank you thank you on behalf of kadeshman carbogen amsis limited that concludes this conference thank you for joining us and you may now disconnect your lines